Welcome back to another exciting episode of our rocket animation challenge. You can see here that our rocket is looking a little more lively than it did last time. Last time it was just a cylinder. Now I have added some parts to our rocket. Let me show you how I worked that out over here in our code. Um, so in order to have all these objects move as one, I'm using the compound function down here. I'll have a link in the description below to a video about how the compound function works. But basically we start with the cylinder that we had last time, the same position, same height, same axis. Um, and uh, basically I'm scaling everything in terms of the rocket's height here. That's gonna be important in a little bit. And then I add a nose cone here using the cone function. And then I added the fins, which involved me learning a new function in vPython. Apparently you can now uh, use this triangle function where you uh, specify the three vertices. Um, you can give a color to each vertex and the object will blend between the colors. I just made them all red so that they're all monochromatic. Um, but I've added those four fins at the bottom, had to do a little finagling with their positions uh, of their vertices, but basically they're attached to the bottom uh, end of the rocket um, and then they stick out uh, with a length that scales with the width of the rocket, which is nice. And then down here we use the compound function to place all of those rocket parts together. So basically rocket underscore parts is a list that has all of those shapes together. And we are compounding all those together into one object, giving it a position of zero, zero, zero for simplicity. And so now I have to attach all the other attributes to the new rocket object here. So we've got the velocity starting out at rest. We've got the mass and the fuel mass, just like we did before. Another thing I learned, I didn't know this before, but a compound object doesn't have a make trail option attached to it. So you have to use the attach trail function. So this is going to attach a trail to the rocket. That's the uh, white streamer that you see coming off of the rocket here. Well, the rocket's finished moving now, so it's about, uh, it's, it's, I think it's gone to transparent at this point, but that's the white streamer you see there. Um, so the rest of the code works pretty much the same way that we had before. Uh, we still have the euler cromer method. Um, I've added a ground object just so that we can see where the thing is launching from. I guess I could call that a launch pad if I wanted to. Um, but I've also added in a, a, an option to have an external force. So in addition to having the uh, rocket propulsion here, uh, this term that has the dm over the total mass times the negative of the exhaust velocity, we now have the external force acting on the rocket, di again divided by the total mass times dt. So this is the part you have normally in the euler cromer method. This is the part we're adding due to the changing mass. And so I've got a couple of options set up here for the external force. Here we have a uniform gravitational force, AKA the weight, uh, that's the uh, rocket's mass times uh, the gravitational field here. Although I guess technically it's not, do you still call it uniform if it's changing with the mass? I mean, it's not constant. There we go, it's not constant, uh, but it is, it is a uniform function. It's not explicitly changing with position. Now, this causes a little bit of a problem in terms of getting the rocket to move because if you just run it with just this force added in, the rocket's going to fall down under its weight uh, before it gets up to speed in terms of launching upward. So I've set up um, a little conditional here where if the rocket hasn't left the ground yet, then we don't turn the force on. Um, so if we only turn the force on if the rocket has left the ground. If the rocket hasn't left the ground yet, then the external force is going to be zero because we have the normal force canceling out the weight. One more thing I've changed is uh, this print statement at the end was checking our rocket velocity against the theoretical velocity for a rocket going through the vacuum of space. What we're doing is looking at the percent change in the velocity due to the external forces. So what we're looking at is, uh, is taking the ratio of the rocket velocity to the theoretical value. So if this is less than this, then it'll show that we've lost something because I'm taking 100% minus this ratio. Um, I guess I could call this a decrease instead of a change. And so when we press Control 2 to run, there it goes. And here goes our position versus time graph. It looks very similar to what we had before. I'm gonna try to get that uh, original one on the screen at the same time as this one so that you can visually compare. But we only had a 1% decrease in the speed due to this uniform weight. Now I'm using arbitrary values for the mass and the external 
gravitational field and everything. So uh, we'll have a better idea of how much this is uh, when we get some actual values in there for some rockets. This is just to uh, prove that this uh, thing can work and that it can be visually interesting. Um, another option you have with your force here, instead of using the uniform gravitational force, uh, you can use the full-fledged Newton's gravitation law uh, for space. So I borrowed the setup from my Let's Build a Solar System series. So this is the same uh, set of code here. I just had to make a little adjustment here to take into account the total mass of the rocket. Uh, but basically we're calculating the gravitational force between the rocket and the Earth. The Earth, I'm just assigning a position and a mass. I didn't actually create a visual for it because it's it's a big thing underneath the rocket's launch pad. And I'm giving it a mass of 10 times the rocket, which is not really realistic. But you know, like I said, we'll put in some more realistic values in the future. I wanna be able to tinker with those off camera. Uh, let's press Control-2 to run this again. There goes our rocket. It goes up regardless. Um, here's our position versus time, it looks very similar, but this time we had a 31% decrease in speed. So that's interesting. Now, of course, again, that's a bit arbitrary because my, uh, my gravitational field here and my uh, gravitational force here are not really related to each other. Though I suppose I could calculate it, couldn't I? So let's take this as negative G, that's one in this case, times the mass of the Earth, Earth dot mass, divided by, you want to take the radius of the Earth squared. So that's going to be Earth.pause.y squared, because that's how far beneath the rocket it is. So let's try using that for the uniform gravitational force here and just see what we get. So when we did the Newton's version, we got a 31% difference. Let's try this one now with the uniform using the appropriate uh, value for the gravitational field. Rocket's still going up, that's good. I mean, that's 41%. Okay, so we lost more with the uniform field than we did with the varying field, which makes sense because the gravitational force is getting weaker as the rocket goes up. So we're not going to lose as much velocity in that case as we are with the uniform field. Okay, I think this has been pretty exciting so far. What I'd like to do next time is actually animate the propellant coming out of the rocket. Uh, you know, this, this little make trail, the streamer here is nice, but I'd like us to animate the propellant coming out of the rocket. I think that'll be a nice visual. And then we can also maybe try uh, changing the direction of the rocket and have that be a, a nice indicator of, of, of where the rocket's going. So thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.